who once said, the more you know your history, the more liberated you are. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming out this weekend to get liberated. So let's get on the friendship train. So Gladys Knight, as the pimps once sung, you don't need a ticket. You just get on board. <laughs> so next to religion, President Herbert Hoover claimed baseball has furnished a greater impact on American life than any other institution. And as we know, black baseball is a product of a segregated institution called America. It was created where the opportunity did not exist, forcing any man with a tan to develop his own team, create his own league, provide private transportation, and empower black businesses along the way. And it became the third largest black-owned business in America after insurance companies and hair care products. So what we have is black baseball, and white baseball. For almost a quarter of a century, Kennesaw Matt Mountain Landis ruled this functional baseball with a Victorian influence that prevented any man darker than the hide or dirty baseball from playing in his all league. Well, in a 1942 article, Los Angeles Times article, Landis fell out of bed and bumped his head and told his biggest lie. He said, there's no band against the tan in reference to the gentleman's agreement. and really stated that there was no rule against him playing. He added any team could sign up a black ball player, but yet there were never ever any black ball players on his ship. Landis' true legacy is not because he failed to act, but because he refused to take action. Landis defended baseball's lack of an official policy when he should have been making a rule saying that baseball shall not discriminate. French philosopher Voltaire once said, every man is guilty of all the good he did not do. And so I add, no one could make a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could do so little. So as we enter World War II, white on teams never entertain hiring players, managers, or coaches, not even a blind on power from the black town. The war depleted the pool of white talent, forcing the apologists, in some cases, to hire four F rejects. They went out and got Tom Sobel, Carl signed him in 1938, he had one eye. <laughs> Bert Shepard, signed by the senators in 45, he had an artificial leg. They even signed Pete Gray, one arm outfielder, made a movie about him. The gatekeepers were signed any type of ball player to fill their rosters except for a black athlete. So sadly, we find Negro leagues are qualified to stop bullets on the battlefield, but not baseballs on the playing field. And as we know, the blood on the battlefield is all the same color. We don't have to be of common color to reach common ground. It was hypocrisy that blacks fighting for this country's freedom, but we're still unable to vote or participate in our national pastime. So when African Americans returned from the war, many found freedom was not free. My father shared with me that they were welcome as heroes, but never as Negroes. Racism and segregation still existed on our homeland. But a new sheriff came into town, now more than 325 years after the first chain and shackled Africans came to America. Our national pastime was now ready to accept a black man. And I think we agree he was not the best athlete, but the best man for the experiment. A man who was his head of a predominantly white university, a lieutenant in the military, majored in lettered in four major sports, engaged to a nurse, a skilled physician. He was a man who was as honest as Diogenes. And if we do a background check, we find him to be as clean as an alcohol spot. Under pressure, he was cool as menthol, at least for the first two years. <laughs> With a heart as pure as ivory gold, ivory soap. A personality as perfect as the Hope Diamond. With the discipline of a Buckingham Palace guard. A black man with a faultless blend and integrity and character was given an opportunity to play a boy's game. 
Let's imagine the psychological barrier Jackie had to encounter. Mentally, Robinson's challenge was overwhelming. The deck was stacked against him. I want you to imagine this. This dark-skinned man put on a white uniform. He was asked to stand in a white chalk batter's box, only a bat made of white ash, standing over a white home plate, attempting to hit a white baseball from a white pitcher between two white foul lines. As eight white men chase this white baseball, he runs to a white first base, be called out or safe by a white umpire as white fans cheer or boo. He was an ink spot on the white canvas of injustice. In this 1972 autobiography, I never had a maid, Robson wrote, I remember standing alone in first base, the only black man on the field. I had to fight hard against loneliness, abuse, and the knowledge that any mistake I made would be magnified because I was the only black man out there. I had to fight hard just to become another guy. Imagine never seeing someone, something that looked like you. But in one case, he did. When a fan released a black cat on the field and said, hey, Mr. Robinson, is this one of your relatives? <coughs> this is one man on his very own being asked to be part of a movement before we invented the term civil rights movement. He had to endure the scorn and ridicule from fans as we examine our own hearts for seeds of racism that some of us were held hostage by social norms. To many black ball players, hope was a four-letter word. Loneliness was their roommate, and sleep their only escape. It has been said many, many times that Babe Ruth changed baseball. I say to you today, Jackie Robinson, changed America. Case in point, before President Truman's he desegregated the military in 1948, before Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954, before Rosa Parks sat on that Montgomery bus and Justice stood up in 1955, before Daisy Bates integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 57, before the March on Washington in 63, before the Civil Rights Act of 64, and before the Voting Rights Act of 65 inspired by the March on Selma. Before all of this, the social change agents in this country were sports figures. Many of them paved the way without protest or anger. And they had as much impact as any lawyer, politician, or civil rights activist could generate for the period. And therefore, I say to you today, black athletes integrated playing fields across America before America was legally integrated. Think about it. That's why black baseball history matters. Thus, we find the entertainment value of racism when Jackie Robinson signs that contract with the Dodgers in 47. In 47, the Dodgers set an attendance record on the road with 1.8 million fans. They shattered attendance records at every National League ballpark except Cincinnati's Crosby Field. At home, they set a franchise attendance record of 1.9 million fans. As you know, they played the Yankees in the first game of the World Series at Yankee Stadium. They had 73,300 plus fans that day for the first game. 73,000 fans. We're talking college football, Rose Bowl, Sugar Bowl, Cotton Bowl, attendance like numbers. Fans spent more than $325,000 for tickets. Robinson's growing influence on the game provoked sports writer Wendell Smith of the Pittsburgh Curry to write. Jackie's nimble, Jackie's quick. Jackie's making the turnstiles fit. <laughs> <laughs> that next year in 48, Satchel Page, in his first Major League start, he drew 72,400 fans at a night game, a record crowd in Cleveland's Municipal Stadium. Many of you remember the mistake by the lake. When you go there, you have to fight off the Nets and the mosquitoes all night. 72,000 plus fans. According to newspaper accounts, they turned away another 20,000 fans to see a 42 year old man from the Negro Leagues start. Satchel's nimble, Satchel's quick. 
introduction of black stars to the show, pockets of every major league owner got a case of the mumps. Does black baseball history matter? Yes. And it should be part of the core curriculum. That is an elective. Can we imagine baseball history being baseball history without the contributions of Satchel Paige, Jackie Robinson, and Ernie Banks, who started from the Kansas City Monarchs, or Roy Campanella, who spent eight or nine years with the Baltimore Elite Giants, Willie Mays from the Birmingham Black Bears, <coughs> Monty Irvin and Larry Doby from the Newark Eagles, and of course Hank Aaron from the Indianapolis Clowns. All of these Hall of Famers are products of the Negro Leagues. And sadly, they and others are only an attitude away from prime time. As Hammer Hank Aaron once said, my ability is only limited by the lack of opportunity. An opportunity denied for more than half a century as this country's collective consciousness could not find its way between baseball's white foul lines. For years, black athletes labored in obscurity, awaiting baseball's triple crown of respect, redemption, and recognition. Ten days before his death in 1972, Robinson made his final public appearance in Game 2 in Cincinnati. Always a fighter, he used this opportunity to express for a black manager to be hired by a major league baseball team. Three, three years later, it came true in 75, when the Cleveland Indians signed Frank Robinson. Frank Robinson had learned to trade in the Puerto Rican Winter Leagues. Think about this, 1975. This is five years after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Some of you may remember his famous words, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We have the brains and technology to put a man into space, but we lack the courage and conviction to make that small step for the minority in our workplace. Democracy or hypocrisy, the choice is yours, and that's why black baseball history matters. Yes, they played in the dust. They rode the raggedy bus. But if you interviewed them, you seldom heard of the bus. These men with fleece locks and bronze bodies were often cheated and mistreated, but in the end, never defeated. They exhibited class and clout. And their revealing stories of triumph and tribulations can raise your consciousness, stir your soul, and sometimes put a tear in your eye. Dignity, pride, courage, and bravery, often words reserved for military heroes. Perhaps it also describes the personalities of Satchel Paige, Jackie Robinson, Larry Doby, Turkey Stearns, and local legends like Hilton Smith and Bullet Bowman as well. There were role models who knew their role, role models, role models who turned back, reached back, and gave back. They were father figures for many like myself before we invented Father's Day. That's why black baseball history matters. So this weekend, take time to discover the greatness of these field hands that shot down Jim Crow when it was legal under the ball eagle. When you place your achievements against the background of discrimination and political upheaval, you make black baseball history all that more impressive. Now it is time to do a checkup from the neck up. We can change the input our, to our minds, but we change the output of our lives, just like these black ball players who came before us did, and change the landscape of American history. They had the will and the skill, the grit and spit, the muscle and hustle to make America great again. Yeah, I went there. <laughs> Discover, discover this exciting, exciting chapter in American history. So let's get on board and make Gladys happy. Can we do that? We, we are the first family of black baseball history. And this weekend, make our forefathers, Jerry Malloy, Robert Peterson, Dick Clark, Dick Ramos, Rick Meiser, 
proud of why we're here today. Welcome to the 19th annual Grand Malloy Nicolay Family Reunion.